All right. Good evening, uh, PFS Task Force. Um, as Vice Chair of the PFAS Task Force due to COVID-19 coronavirus crisis, and in accordance with Governor Sununu's emergency order number 12, pursuant to Executive Order 2020-04, the PFAS Task Force is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to the meeting, which is authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. However, in accordance with the emergency order, this is to confirm that we are a providing public access to the public access to the meeting by telephone. All members of the task force have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through an electronic platform. The public has access to contemporaneously listen and, if necessary, participate in this meeting through dialing the following phone number, 1-415-930-5321, and when prompted, enter the access code 286-327-507. B, providing public notice of the necessary information for assessing, accessing rather, this meeting. We previously gave notice to the public on on how to access the meeting via telephone dial-in information that I just provided. C, provide a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anybody has a problem, please call Lisa Drabeck during the meeting at 603-479-3499 or send an email to ldrabeck at londonderrynh.org. Adjourn the, adjourning the meeting if the public is unable to access the meeting. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, we will adjourn the meeting and have it rescheduled at a different time. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call. I'm going to start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When I say your name, please uh, state your present and also state if there's anybody in the room uh, which is required under the right to know law. I will start. Jim Dukakis. Jim, are you there? Lisa, do you show Jim? I do, and I've unmuted him. Okay, that's why. Yeah, I'm here, Lisa. Uh, I'm here, Bob, and no one else is in the room with me. Thank you, Jim. Greg Durrett. Craig Durrett is here. Anyone in the room, Craig? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Is there anyone else in the room, Craig? Oh, no. Thank you, sir. And Fenn? Lisa, do you see Ann? I don't see Ann, no. Okay. Tom Garside? I see Tom Gar Tommy Garside and he is unmuted. Tom Garside, are you present? <laughs> He sent a message that he is here um, in the chat. So I guess, Tom, do you have anybody in the room with you? You can respond in the chat. <laughs> no one in the room. Thank you. George Kadzok, I'm sorry. <laughs> George, you're here, and I think I'm reading your lips. There's no one in the room. Thank you. Paul Lockwood? Uh, can you repeat who that was? Paul Lockwood? Uh, I don't see Paul on the list yet. Okay. Brian Lockhart. Hi, Brian. Hi, I'm here, and there's no one in the room with me. Thank you, Brian. David Robinson?
David appears in the list and I've sent him an unmute request. David, are you able to speak? David, are you able to type in the chat? Yeah, he I sent a message. In... Okay, you got it. <laughs> Sorry. All right, I'm going to stop through. Is David here? David is here and no one is present with him. Okay, great. Kate McDonald is not here, I presume? Correct. So, Lisa, do we have a quorum? Yes. Okay. One final note. Um, this meeting is actually being presented by multiple New Hampshire DES staff members with provisions for PFAS task force members to be seen and speak and ask questions. Considering this desired format and the current COVID-19 concerns, it was determined that the most efficient and safe meeting method would be for the DES to host and control the meeting. This will mean that any members of the public who are calling in to listen or are watching via the link will not be able to speak tonight. As such, the task force will not be able to entertain public comment tonight, but will do so at our next scheduled meeting. Also, once the presentation is completed, this meeting will end and we will take up all other task force business at our next scheduled meeting. We want to thank Paul Lockwood for contacting NHDES and initiating prep preparations for this presentation. And we thank the New Hampshire DES for preparing this presentation. And with that, I'll turn it over to the DES staff. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you everybody. Um, so I just wanted to make sure my screen is showing. That can you see the screen? Yep. Okay, great. Um, all right, great. Thanks. Nice to see you. Uh, my name is Erin Holmes, and I'm the Drinking Water and Groundwater Trust Fund Administrator with the Department of Environmental Services. Um, like I, I think uh, Bob mentioned, just as a housekeeping, you know, just please try to keep your mics muted if you're not speaking. And then as panelists, you can mute and unmute yourself, and you can turn your cameras on and off. Um, first, I would just like to thank you for the opportunity uh, to present this information to you tonight. And we're here to provide a history of the PFAS really investigation in the state or in southern New Hampshire, and then an overview of the PFAS impacts affecting residents and public water systems within London Dairy. We're going to provide an overview of the investigation, um, talking about the sampling and the occurrence of PFAS in residential wells, as well as the occurrence of PFAS in the public water systems. And we have a lot of uh, information we can present about that. And then we'll fi finish up with a discussion of the financial assistance programs that are in place today that are available for some of these water systems to either tap into and prepare for treatment or eventual connection to a water line. And as we were requested by the task force to present, we're really here to provide an overview of really what's been happening in London Dairy. But I just wanted to announce here and just remind everybody that the DES will be planning a town meeting with the town of London Dairy. And the date for that is May 20th. So this is just to get us in front of the task force, um, present the overview, answer some of their questions, and we intend to provide a lot more information that we know the town is anxious for in May at that town meeting. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Mike Wimsad. Mike Wimsad is the division director for the Waste Management Division at the Department of Environmental Services, and give me one second to give him mouse control of the presentation. All this great technology. Okay, Mike. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, and I, I want to take this opportunity to thank um, the, the, the task force for inviting us to present before you this evening. We're happy to do this, and we hope that it provides you with a good sort of basis of information for which to start your work. Um, my job this evening, I, the, the much smarter and capable people will follow me, and they're going to give you a lot of details about all of this. And I, I feel like my job this evening is just to kind of try to orient you to how we got here um, to uh, talk about you know what PFAS are to make sure that everybody is on kind of an even playing field with respect to understanding what the contaminants are um, to uh, give you an idea of DES's PFAS work in southern New Hampshire and how it began 
um, and how we've been responding to the impacts to drinking water quality that have occurred. And then um, also give you a little bit of information about a lot of people are aware that there's a consent decree that DES and St. Gobain uh, entered into um, back in 2018, give you a little bit of understanding of what that means for communities and in particular what it, what it me means for Londonderry. And then also just give you an idea um, of the, how we got to where the current drinking water standards that we're enforcing and, and, and how that plays in. And that'll really cue it up for the speaker who will follow me, who's Jeff March, who's gonna really go into the details, give you kind of a deep dive on the information and data that we've been collecting in your town. So with that, I'll just get underway. Um, well, there we go. Uh, so um, first of all, everybody needs to understand what PFAS are, and it, that's a word. You know, we've been we kind of just passed the five-year anniversary, if you will, of of, uh, of uh, the discovery of PFAS contamination in Southern New Hampshire. So probably almost everybody's heard the term by now, but there's a lot of misunderstanding about what it really means. And essentially, it's a, it's a very big class of organic compounds. They're synthetic. They don't occur in nature. Um, and they are basically uh, carbon chains that, that have uh, a lot of fluorine atoms on them. That's the chemist's view of what PFAS are. The two most studied PFAS and the, things, the, the compounds we probably know the most about in terms of their occurrence and, and potential health effects associated with them are PFOA, perfluorooctanoic acid, and that's really the primary contaminant that we're talking about when we talk about the impacts in southern New Hampshire from the St. Cobain facility in Merrimack. Um, and then perfluorooctane sulfonate, it, PFOS, uh, which is actually a compound that is um, present Often it's uh, associated with firefighting foams. So when we talk about sites where firefighting foams have been applied, that's one of the primary contaminant we tend to see. But again, the PFAS family, PFAS is a very broad term and it describes thousands of very diverse compounds, but what they all have in common is a carbon chain with fluorines on them. So just to sort of give you an idea what the family tree looks like of, of PFAS, and because it, one of the problems is it becomes an alphabet soup and people get confused easily. And what I'm hoping this slide will do if, with a little bit of me talking about it will help you kind of decipher all that. So PFAS stands for per and polyfluoroalkylated substances. So the first two uh, things you see on the tree there on the left and the right are perfluoroalkyls and per polyfluoroalkyls. And all that really means is a perfluoroalkyl just means that the carbons have all the fluorines they can possibly hold. And a polyfluoro means that one or two are missing and, and instead they have a hydrogen. So for the average person, it doesn't really matter. We just want to know that PFAS is a very inclusive term. And down here on the ground, sort of like the apple that fell from the tree, is a PFC. And that is the term we were using early on because, of course, PFOS and PFOA, the two compounds we talk about most, are in that category of perfluoroalkyls. So PFC and perfluoroalkyls are really synonymous with one another. And we show PFC on the ground because it's just sort of a term that has sort of fallen out of favor because we like to talk about it more inclusively by referring to the, the PFAS group, which includes both the polys and the pers. So I, I know that's a lot of words. I just wanted to share that with you. And then the other ones on the tree here, PFOS and PFO, I've just, talked about, and those are the two compounds that uh, we've been most focused on, particularly PFOA in Southern New Hampshire. And then PFHXS and PFNA are two additional compounds. And when I, when I talk to you about the drinking water standards that we've set, we included, in addition to PFOS and PFOA, we included those two compounds because we had enough information to develop drinking water standards for them. So that, I hope, helps kind of demystify this. What you're going to mostly hear people say is PFAS. And when they say that, they're talking about the broad, um, you know, uh, family of compounds, which includes a lot of different compounds. So PFAS, uh, we, we're finding them in lots of places in New Hampshire. We can find them in soil and groundwater. They can be in food. And the reason is that they've been so broadly used in commerce. So PFAS uh, were first invented. I said they were a synthetic chemical. They were first invented around the 19, late 1940s. And um, since that time, 
industry has found and science has found so many different uses for them. They're particularly useful because they, they, they both can resist water and they can resist grease, which is a pretty uncommon thing for one chemical to do. And but because, so Teflon, you know, the, 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 the thing they coat pans with and they coat rain gear with, um, that's probably the earliest use that most people were aware of. But as you can see from this list, there are just so many uses so many consumer products and industrial products that they've been used in. So as a result, you know, the good news is they, they're pretty effective. They do a lot of very good things very well that we need. Um, you know, I think they're in heart valves and things like that, but um, they also are so widely used in commerce that we find them in a lots, of, lots of places. So, oops, I got ahead of myself here. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit about how we started our work on PFAS in Southern New Hampshire. So as I said, we kind of hit the five-year anniversary of this. Back in very late February of 2016, the St. Cobain facility, which is a, a St. Cobain Performance Plastics, is a, is a manufacturing facility located in Merrimack that manufactures um, coated, mostly coated fabrics, and they coat it with Teflon related products and they use emulsions that contain uh, or did for many years contain PFOA as a primary component in the in the emulsions and um, they had had some problems very immediately before February of 2016 they had discovered some drinking water contamination problems both in New York State and in Vermont and so as a result they took a look at the water coming into their facility in Merrimack and unfortunately, they did find that there was PFOA detected in that water at 30 parts per trillion. And the interesting thing about that is that was actually supplied water from the Merrimack Village District public water system. It was not a, it was not a private water supply well on the property. It was actually local public water. And so that uh, was a great cause for concern. It was reported to DES. And we took immediate steps along with MVD, the, the water district, to sample both public water system wells and private drinking water wells in the vicinity of the plant. And uh, we, we quickly sort of, as we worked our way out and tried to look at you know, what was the extent of it, we actually went across the river, across the Merrimack River um, in Litchfield and we found contamination there. And that's when it became evident to us that we weren't dealing with what we would call a conventional release, which is where something is spilled on the ground, gets into the formation, leaches into groundwater, and then we see it in groundwater. But we believe it was an airborne transport pathway, which is not unheard of, but it's not a common way that we see significant groundwater contamination in New Hampshire. So that was very important to us, and it was a really important finding, and it meant that we had to really expand our testing rapidly. And, and that testing eventually show that we also had drinking water well impacts in London Dairy, and we'll talk in much more detail about those um, later in the night. So uh, the incident response to that was unlike anything DES had ever undertaken. We um, used all of the tools we had available to us. We used geographic information systems to try to figure out where people were on private wells, where they were supplied with public water. We did mailings. I mean, in the early going, we had staff working on weekends and nights, knocking on doors, trying to get as many samples of drinking water wells as we possibly could, as quickly as we could. And as we did that, we got hundreds of samples and we found that the impacts were very widespread. And so the short-term solution for that, at the time, EPA was still working out what they thought was a reasonable standard to use to determine, to determine when drinking water was safe. And uh, shortly after our, our you know, work started on this in March, uh, in April, EPA came out with a recommended health advisory level for PFOA and PFOS individually or combined concentration at 70 parts per trillion. And we'll talk a little bit later how New Hampshire responded to that. But that gave us a benchmark to look at for deciding when we needed to provide people with bottled water. And so in the short term, uh, bottled water was provided to people whose wells were impacted. Um, the long-term strategy, of course, we don't ever see bottled water as a, as a permanent solution. It's something you do quickly and it can provide safety very quickly and immediately. But the, the long-term solution typically is to get some kind of alternate water, either through connection to a public water system or connection to our installation of some kind of in-home or in-facility treatment. And uh, so the ultimate response in the, in the area of impacted by St. Cobain 
were large scale water line projects that were funded by St. Cobain. And we'll talk a little bit about how we got there with those projects. So in Londonderry, um, a lot of the sampling and alternate water planning is still ongoing. And we're gonna get into more detail about that tonight. So I wanna talk a little bit about the St. Cobain consent decree. So, so as we're collecting this information from 2016 to 2018, we're learning that we have hundreds of people whose wells are impacted. We have some public water supply wells that are impacted and we're working and, and, and talking with the company about how they need to, what their responsibilities are with respect to addressing that. And so um, what they were being asked to do is to spend tens of millions of dollars on extension of drinking water systems to hundreds of people. And so that became a bit of a legal negotiation. And what we ended up entering into was a consent decree that was completed in 2018. And it did a couple of important things that I think it's important for people to understand. And I'm gonna toggle back and forth between this slide and the following slide, which, um, okay, I'm not sure why it won't go. Here we go. This 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 slide on the right, um, that, that's a picture of the facility on the left there from the air. And the arrow goes to right in the center of this slide here is where that facility is located. The Merrimack facility is located right on the Merrimack River in Merrimack. Um, so I'm going to talk about the red line here, which we call the pre-groundwater management zone. And I'll tell you why it's called that in a moment. And the blue line, which we refer to as the outer boundary. And these are important. Um, concepts in the consent decree that I just want to take a moment to explain. So what the consent decree establishes is that within that red line that I showed you, which we, we call it a pre-groundwater management zone or pre-GMZ, the reason it's called that is under state law, when you impact drinking water, or excuse me, when you impact groundwater quality, there's a requirement to uh, investigate, determine the extent of the impacts. And then what we essentially do is draw an imaginary line around the, the lateral extent of the impacts, and we call that the groundwater management zone. And so since we weren't done at the time, in 2018, we knew we weren't done de de uh, describing or, or you know, completely uh, investigating the extent of that groundwater management zone. The term we used was a pre-GMZ, pre meaning based on what we know right now and what we knew at that time, everything inside that red line, there were widespread impacts above 70 parts per trillion. So that's how we designated that. And what the consent decree said for that was that it was made very clear that St. Cobain had a responsibility under the terms of the consent decree to broadly provide alternate water inside that pre-GMZ area. And so it's easier to talk about the area inside and then all the way outside first, and then we'll talk about the middle or what I might call the donut. So outside the outer boundary or outside that blue line that I described before, uh, basically, St. Cobain, under the terms of the consent decree, does not have responsibility to address impacts outside that blue line unless those impacts impact groundwater above 70 parts per trillion. So that, that's an important thing to understand. Then if you go into the middle, which I'll call the donut, so the space between the red line and the blue line, the space between the pre-GMC and the outer boundary, that essentially is an area where the state retains all of its original authorities um, to uh, require a responsible party to investigate and address impacts above drinking water or groundwater standards. So um, that's what that means. That's what that area means. And so what that means for Londonderry is that parts of Londonderry, and, and Jeff uh, Martz is gonna show you an even more detailed uh, drawing that shows you how this parts of Londonderry are to the west of that, uh, are inside that outer boundary. And in those areas, we have uh, expected and required um, St. Cobain to investigate impacts, and they have done that in a cooperative fashion, and they continue to do that. And as we move forward and we identify those impacts and look for a remedy, we will expect them to participate in providing alternate water to, to, to areas within that blue line where we believe the impacts are as a result of their, their emissions. Now, um, it's also true in London Dairy that on the outside of the blue line, we're now finding, because we, we went through and we had a 70 part per trillion standard, but now as I'll talk about in a moment, we have a lower standard, we're finding that there are impacts east of the blue line, so outside the outer boundary, that have impacted drinking water wells 
above the standards, the current standards, um, and we believe that in, in many cases those are associated with the emissions from the facility. So that's an area that's a little more difficult because under the consent decree, St. Cobain only has a responsibility to address those impacts if they're over 70 parts per trillion. And what we're finding, as you'll see when J Jeff presents his data, is we do see a lot of impacts, but most of them are below 70 parts per trillion, but above the current standard. So I, I didn't want to dwell on that too much, but I think it's an important concept to understand. So I want to take some time to explain it. And Jeff's going to be making some distinctions about that in his presentation. So lastly, I just want to give you an idea how we got to our drinking water standards. So as I mentioned, back in April of 2016, just about a month or so after we started doing our work in earnest here in southern New Hampshire, um, EPA came out with this health advisory level of 70 parts per trillion for um, PFOA and PFOS, um, either individually or in concentration, in combined concentration. And we very quickly went through an emergency rulemaking in April to adopt that as our ambient groundwater quality standard. And that gave us clear authority to um, require that the responsible party investigate and, and, and remediate in cases where wells were impacted above that standard. So then as you know, these are emerging contaminants where we're learning a lot more about them. Um, as time went on, there was more and more information from a toxicological standpoint. And um, it became evident that we felt that we had enough information to start look at developing an actual enforceable drinking water standard. The ambient groundwater quality standard is a, is a groundwater standard that we use to govern how um, responsible parties investigate and clean up their sites. But a drinking water MCL or maximum contaminant level is an enforceable level for public drinking water systems. And, and the public water systems that are regulated have to meet that standard. So uh, we went through a rulemaking that became effective in September 30th of 2019 after doing a very thorough uh, review of the toxicology. And we established um, MCLs and AGQS for four compounds. And I'm just gonna run to the uh, next slide here to show you what we, where we came down on that. So in, in September of 2019, we implemented rules that set a standard for PFOA of 12 parts per trillion, which is a lot lower than the 70 we were working with earlier. PFOS for 15, again, much lower than 70. And then for PFHXS and PFNA, which we don't really see in the meaningful concentrations in the, in the study area, so I'm not gonna dwell on them, but those were set at 18 and 11. So um, the history was is that we, we set those standards by rule in September of 2019. And then almost immediately, 3M and some other parties filed suit against the state um, seeking a preliminary injunction to bar us from enforcing those standards. And um, as of December 31st, 2019, the Merrimack County Superior Court imposed that injunction. And so the, the basically we were enjoined from enforcing those standards for a period of time while the legal process uh, you know, played itself out. And so while that was still pending, the New Hampshire legislature actually made those very same standards effective as a matter of law, essentially mooting the case. Um, and so in July of 2020, Governor Sununu signed that bill and that House Bill 1264, which established those four standards as the enforceable standards in New Hampshire. So since July of 2020, those standards have been in place. So I, I hope that that, I, I'm kind of a whirlwind here and I've talked a lot, but I want to just give you as much core background on how we got to where we are with respect to how we've investigated this, how we're responding and how we regulate these materials. And that's going to, I'm going to next uh, turn it over to Jeff Martz, who is going to uh, um, give you a much more detailed understanding of, uh, of, of what we're finding in the work we've been doing in London. Yeah, I think, um, thank you, Mike. I guess before we move on, just because of the complexity and the amount of information, you know, I don't want to open up for too many questions, but does anybody have any burning questions right now that they want to ask Mike before we get to the very end of this? Um, George, are you able, do you have audio? Oh, you might just be muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, okay, good. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I, I understand that there were standards in place for safe uh, levels. And uh, quite frankly, I, I, I've seen these uh, before in the past, so many PPB for this, so many PPT for that. 
but until it impacted uh, my water system, um, it's almost like I didn't really pay much attention to it. So, so one of the questions is, it almost sounds like the standards applied were arbitrary, uh, whereas I would have thought they would have been based on, uh, say, some sort of Department of Health studies on impacts uh, of these chemicals on cells, uh, you know, mitosis, cancer, whatever. Um, so, 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 so that's kind of like one of the burning questions: is uh, where does this level come from? Like, like, in other words, how, how is it justified? Sure. So that's a great question. So, and I, and I can understand that it, it it erodes people's confidence when you start at one number and then you go to a much lower number. People wonder why that happened. And you know, EPA had looked at certain information. I mean, actually, if you go back further, they had even higher standards that, that they and they didn't have enforceable standards. They had what are called health advisory levels. And originally, when we first learned about this, there was a provisional health advisory level um, that was higher. And uh, we were not all that trusting of that. It was we we had not, we wanted our own staff to look at that and evaluate it. Fortunately, EPA had been doing, as it happened, a lot of work to evaluate more of the toxicology toxicological studies that were available and more of the health related information that was available. And so we pressed them. We knew they were working on that right as we discovered this problem back in 2016. We pressed them to develop that new health advisory level. They did that and in, in, and they basically, and I think it was right at the end of March or very early April, they established this health advisory level of 70 parts per trillion. So that was the best information available to us at that time. And we grabbed onto that, went through a rulemaking, an emergency rulemaking. And by the end of April, that had become law, had or had become an administrative rule, an enforceable rule in New Hampshire. Um, but many folks, including us, were concerned that we really needed to have a deeper dive on that. And we actually worked with the New Hampshire legislature because we didn't really have the, um, the personnel who were qualified to do those reviews. The legislature gave us the authority to hire a toxicologist, and we had hired a, a really terrific guy named John Alley, which uh, pr he'll probably be at our public meeting in May, so folks will get a chance to meet him, um, who he worked with others, and we actually hired out a contract toxicologist from the University of Florida as well to help kind of peer review his work. And they did an exhaustive set of review of all the toxicological studies and papers that were available over several months before developing the proposed standards that be eventually became law in July. So I would say, the, 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 I, I would say no, that it's not random at all. But the, the, those uh, numbers that you see for the current MCLs and AGQS that we're enforcing are based on very careful review of the toxicology. They're based on specific health endpoints. And uh, we're probably going to have John talk a little bit about that at our public meeting in May so that folks can understand that and maybe ask some questions on it. Okay. Aaron, I have a question also. Okay, yeah. Uh, Mike, can you help us understand that where New Hampshire is now at um, 12 parts per trillion, but the EPA is still at 70? Right. Do you see the, us heading? more towards the EPA level or the EPA heading more towards our level or is it still that much of an impasse? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't try to guess what EPA is going to do. I can tell you, I don't think we're going to head towards their level. We have a really have a scientific difference of opinion with the agency on that. We, we stand by the numbers we develop. We think that they are defensible. Um, you know, I, I, there's a lot, uh, the, the history of standard setting for EPA is that they tend to be rather slow. They, you know, they've got obviously the impact of what they do on a national level is very significant and they think long and hard before moving. Um, but in this particular case, we believe that, you know, for the first time ever, we had some resources that allowed us to do a really careful deep dive on this. And not only do we stand by our numbers, but many other states who've also had very qualified toxicologists and health professionals review this, are landing in a very similar place. There are a number of states that have landed at numbers that are very close to what we we established. Well, that was my follow-up. Is do you know of any states that are that have lowered their uh, level of uh, allowable contamination to to ours to the 12, or are they all still around the EPA level? Oh no, many there, there are several. And actually, I, I was trying to keep my presentation shorter. We have a slide that shows that there are a number of states that are 
right in that same range with us. And actually, a couple of states that um, not only do that, but in, but take either four or six compounds and their combined concentration regulate them at about 20 parts per trillion, which is even more stringent than what we're doing. When, when our toxicologist reviewed the available data, we did not find a defensible scientific basis to use a combined concentration, so we didn't do that. But some states, for whatever reason, have, have, have seen their way clear to do that. So there are some states that at some level are regulating these contaminants even more stringently than we are. I, I know that we're focusing on, on the PFAS uh, issue, but what about other contaminants like arsenic and things like that? Are you gonna get hit on those as part of the presentation? That's a terrific question. And actually, Brandon Kernan is going to be talking about public water supply wells. And Brandon is our drinking water and groundwater bureau chief. He knows a lot about what other, you know, naturally occurring contaminants exist in London dairy water and what the concerns are for those. So I'm sure he could answer some questions if you have them on that. Great. Thank, thank you, Mike. You're welcome. Thanks. All right, so moving on, um, Jeff, if you would just like to introduce yourself as well um, and so everybody know who knows who you are and then, um, yeah, I'm just going to mute myself and then you can have control back. <laughs> thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Mike. Uh, thanks, members of the PFAS uh, Task Force uh, for having us here tonight. Uh, so my name is Jeff Martz. I'm a senior hydrogeologist with the Hazardous Waste Remediation Bureau in DES. And the Hazardous Waste Remediation Bureau is responsible for management of contaminated sites uh, involving PFAS. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about the uh, some of the sources of PFAS in the town of Londonderry and uh, take a dive into the groundwater data that's been collected to date. So this is a map showing uh, Londonderry. I've, I've uh, blued out the uh, surrounding towns, uh, and it shows uh, some of the known PFAS sources in the town, which I broadly categor categorize into two groups. Uh, first, we have the St. Cobain air emissions, which are uh, a, a blanket air deposition that has occurred emitted from the smokestacks at St. Cobain, as uh, Mike Wimsat described, and that the uh, PFAS have traveled through the air deposited on the ground as either wet particle, wet wet deposition through rainfall and snow, or as dry particles that have just uh, kind of landed as a sort of a dust, uh, covering broad areas and impacting numerous wells. Uh, and then there are uh, a number of discrete uh, release sites, uh, which tend to be smaller in nature. And, um, you know, in some cases there are offsite wells that are impacted by these releases, but uh, compared to the aerial deposition sources, the number of impacted wells is uh, generally much smaller. Um, you can see on the screen, if you if you can see my cursor, the blue outer boundary line that Mike described in uh, Londonderry that primarily follows high range road. So areas to the west of high range road are within the St. Cobain consent decree outer boundary and areas to the east are outside the boundary. Um, so just a, a few examples, the uh, pink stars are hazardous waste remediation sites that have detected PFAS in on-site monitoring wells. So some examples include the uh, Tankersville, Mammoth Road, the Manchester Airport where AFFF has been used for training and uh, uh, protection, fire protection at the airport. Uh, we also have the Auburn Road landfill, which is a super fun site up in the northeast portion of Londonderry, and uh, two sites in southeastern Londonderry include the Apple Tree Mall, where uh, you know a number of off-site wells were contaminated, and uh, the Tinkham Garage Superfund site. And there, there's a number of other ones. I, di I didn't point all of those out. Um, most of these star sites have project managers assigned to them from uh, Hazardous Waste Remediation Bureau. I happen to manage the Apple Tree Mall in addition to St. Cobain. And I also work on the Manchester Airport, but I have a, a general level of familiarity with uh, many of them. So there are five primary sources of PFAS sampling data uh, for the town of Londonderry. Uh, St. Cobain is conducting uh, the investigation inside the outer boundary, and they are evaluating the extent of ambient groundwater quality exceedances uh, within that area due to discharges from their facility. Um, when the new standards first went into effect in September 2019, St. Cobain submitted a work plan to conduct that investigation, and subsequently they have submitted eight addenda to that work plan that identify properties for sampling 
Uh, the most recent addenda was submitted uh, late yesterday, and I've taken a very quick look at it. Uh, St. Cobain also submits regular biweekly updates and bimonthly reports to NHDES, and all of these reports are available uh, to the public on OneStop. Uh, the second source of data is uh, NHDES is sampling outside the consent decree boundary, so to the east of High Range Road. Uh, they're sampling private wells, and that's primarily uh, driven by notification uh, program where we, when DES is alerted to a well that exceeds AGQS, uh, letters are sent to uh, surrounding property owners within 500 feet of that exceedance. And uh, they're currently invited to sign up on a private well testing forum that's on the web, uh, NHDES's uh, PFAS investigation page. Uh, we sometimes refer to that as a survey monkey page where they can uh, identify themselves and request uh, sampling. Uh, the third, third source is uh, the town of Londonderry conducts uh, groundwater sampling periodically. I guess this town is, is one of a unique town that has actually taken interest in groundwater and sampled periodically over several decades. And uh, I believe it was in 2018 or 2019, they included PFAS in the uh, town-wide uh, sampling. So. Uh, they generated a number of data points from both surface water, groundwater, uh, and private wells. And um, I've lumped into this group also residents. There are a number of private residents uh, that submit their results to DES, and that data gets included into our EMD and our GIS data sets. Uh, each of the discrete release sites that I note, noted on the map, the uh, STARS, they are required to do uh, sampling. Uh, at their site, and if there are any offsite impacted wells, do that sampling. The, that sampling is conducted by the responsible parties and paid for by the responsible parties in most cases. And uh, finally, the fifth, fifth source uh, is the public water supply well sampling, and, and Brandon is going to talk about the uh, public water supply well data a after uh, I talk. And um, my talk mainly focuses on uh, residential wells and monitoring wells, so I'm, I'm not going to be talking about the public wells uh, as part of my talk. Uh, so here is a map showing uh, the groundwater data that we have for PFOA. And as Mike mentioned in the introduction, PFOA is the primary PFAS that is driving ambient groundwater quality exceedances in the town. So I've uh, symbolized the groundwater results uh, for the concentration of PFOA, which is measured in parts per trillion, which is equivalent to nanograms per liter. And if you, if you look at the uh, color symbology down at the bottom of the slide, uh, anything that's colored green was either uh, non-detect or, or PFOA was not detected in the sample or was up to half of the AGQS or six parts per trillion. Uh, yellow and orange are intermediate between half of the AGQS and 12 parts per trillion. And anything that exceeds 12 parts per trillion is colored red on this map. And you can see that you know there are a number of uh, red results uh, across the town of Londonderry. And there are a handful of wells that exceed 70 parts per trillion, uh, which is colored purple. So you can see uh, there's, there's a scattering of those. Um, many are associated with discrete sites, um, but we do have a few that uh, exceed 70 uh, located throughout town. So to date, about 12, just under 1,200 wells have been sampled across, across Londonderry. 380 of those are from within the consent decree, and 807 are, have been sampled outside the consent decree. Of that nearly 1,200 wells that have been sampled, approximately half, or 561, have exceeded one or more of the AGQS for PFAS. Um, primarily, PFOA is the main driver, as we said before. 234 of those wells are inside the consent decree, and 327 are outside the consent decree. So with roughly half of the wells exceeding AGQS, I, I want to point out that uh, the focus of the sampling efforts has been on areas that uh, we would expect the most contamination or there's uh, you know, prior detections. So sampling has expanded outward from where we have known exceedance in groundwater. So um, the exceedance rate may be somewhat skewed higher. Uh, you know, I think if we go into some of the areas of town where we only have uh, green circles, so less than half of uh, the AGQS, I think that would drive the exceedance rate of the total number of samples downward. So there is some geography to the distribution of PFOA uh, across the town. It's not uniform. So now I'm going to drill into the area inside the consent decree. And what I'm showing here are uh, excerpts of uh, figures from uh, 
Golder Associates, who is the consultant for St. Gobain. The, this figure is from their uh, number seven addenda to the water supply well sampling work plan. Uh, the regional map uh, in the upper right shows the entire consent decree involving Bedford, Merrimack, Litchfield, uh, Hudson, uh, as well as Londonderry. And then I've broken out and zoomed in on the town of Londonderry uh, in the, the larger map, and I've kind of grayed out uh, Litchfield uh, off to the west. Um, but it, it's a very complex map. There's a lot of colors, and I'll, I'll just very quickly walk you through, and then I'll, I'll tell you what the big takeaway that, that I see when I look at this map. Um, so the, the light blue shading indicates that uh, properties are, are close to public water, but not necessarily confirmed to public water. Uh, St. Cobain is working on, uh, through their consultants, confirming those connections. The green shaded lots are properties that are confirmed connected to public water, so they've reached out to the utilities and, and confirmed that connection. The brown colored lots are properties where St. Cobain has uh, invited the residents to um, have their well tested and they either accepted that and the well was tested and the results came back uh, either below standard or they have not yet come back at, at the time they generated this figure um, or they haven't responded, uh, but they have been contacted by St. Cobain. And then the pink lots uh, or the, the reddish shading indicates uh, properties that St. Cobain has offered bottled water to the occupants uh, due to a groundwater exceedance of uh, the water supply well that was sampled on the property. And finally, the uh, blue hatched pattern, uh, primarily down in the, the southern part of this map, shows properties that were most recently identified for sampling in Addendum 7, and I'll, I'll drill into that a little more in the next slide. But I'll, what I want to take away is that you know, much of the area within the consent decree in Londonderry has been addressed to some extent uh, from an investigation standpoint by St. Cobain. So, you know, the lots that remain to be addressed in some fashion are uh, colored white primarily uh, on, this, on this map. So now I'm drilling into the, the lower portion of that uh, figure I showed on the previous slide. And uh, one question I get asked quite a bit from residents is why, why was I selected for sampling? Uh, what, what criteria was used? So there's, there's three main categories. Uh, the first is, um, and this is somewhat more recent in addendas, uh, probably six and seven and now eight, is uh, neighborhood scale identification where multiple lots have been identified for St. Cobain uh, for uh, inclusion in the sampling, in the next round of sampling uh, that's going on. The second bin, which is uh, really driven the investigation, uh, is proximity to an ambient groundwater quality exceedance where uh, St. Cobain's consultants buffer uh, around a lot and select the adjoining lots and identify those for the next round of sampling. So. Um, the sampling has really been driven by a risk-based uh, proximity to a known contamination and working outward. And, you know, I've been told over the phone anecdotally that some of the incoming data uh, has uh, a, a somewhat lower frequency of exceedance. So I think they're starting to get into areas that uh, may be less contaminated relative to where they have been have been working. And then, then the third bin is uh, what I would call a quasi-random selection of uh, properties in areas where uh, PFAS data is widespread, so big open areas. So we have uh, lots that are selected to try and fill in some data gaps to, to get a sense if there are any hot spots that uh, need further attention. So what we're finding when we drill down into the, the data, and I'm using the same color ramp here for PFOA, so the greens are less than 50% or non-detect of the AGQS. What we find is that we have, on a neighborhood scale, we have houses that exceed ambient groundwater quality standard immediately adjacent to, to properties that don't. So there's a lot of variability uh, on the house-to-house -house level in, in some places. This is especially true in parts of Londonderry where you know next door neighbors could be above and people across the street can be below and there's a lot of variability. And I think this variability is a result of the uh, complexity of aerial deposition. So uh, on the upper right here, uh, the cutout that's uh, color-coded just illustrates uh, conceptually the air deposition based on some modeling that uh, DES did evaluating PFOA emissions from the facility and what that deposition looked like on the ground. So there's variation in terms of that. Uh, the surficial geology plays a role in uh, one of my next slides. I'll, I'll give a little example of how surficial geology plays a role in Londonderry. 
Um, finally, bedrock factors uh, play a, a, an important role, I think, in this, this variability from well to well. And finally, time-related time, time related factors, such as changes in the chemicals that have been released from the facility over time, uh, precursor transformations, which involve um, chemicals that break down into the regulated compounds. Uh, we didn't really talk about that yet, and we can go into that in later detail in a subsequent meeting or if you have questions. And finally, seasonal variation, I think, plays a role in the complexity that we see in the maps. So uh, talking about surficial geology, I'm referring to um, soil deposits that are above the bedrock. So uh, most of the wells in Londonderry are bedrock wells, but there are a few uh, what we call dug wells or driven wells, uh, which are, are derive their water from the uh, surficial deposits or the overburden. Um, hey, and much of the... Jeff, I had a quick question. I'm sorry sure. to interrupt. No um, problem. I, I read an article recently about um, how a drought can uh, raise uh, levels of arsenic uh, or raise the levels of concerns for arsenic where it's naturally occurring uh, when there's a drought that's present. Now, we're, we're kind of in a dry period, extended dry period. Is that, is that condition, is that environmental condition uh, impactful when, it, when you talk about PFAS as well? That, that, that's a really great question. I, I cut that, that's another slide that I cut out of my view to be brief here, but um, we have a limited amount of data, uh, primarily from the sampling St. Cobain has done in Bedford, because uh, they started sampling there in 2016 when they were investigating the extent of 70. And they have some wells that they've sampled over time for a period of four years. And what we have found in the bedrock residential supply wells is that um, in general, the concentrations tend to decrease when we have lower water levels in the bedrock aquifer. So as during a time of drought, I might anticipate slightly lower concentrations of PFOA. Um, and, you know, in, in this limited uh, set of wells that have been studied for, you know, several years, um, we tended to find higher concentrations when the water levels in the aquifer recovered and, and, and came back up. So, I'm only talking about nine or 10 wells, so it's a very small number of the total throughout the area. Um, so, I, but, I, but I think there is a seasonality component that uh, you know, we need to continue to um, expand our understanding of. Jeff? Yes. Um, I have a question too. Um, I have one of the few driven wells in, in Londonderry. It's a 40 foot deep well. I'm right next to Beaver Brook. I just got my test back, test results back the other day and I did exceed um, PFOS, but none of the others. Um, have, have you reached any conclusions about whether whether shallow wells like mine, which are drawing on the shallow aquifer, are often more contaminated than bedrock wells? I guess, uh, you know, I would characterize shallow wells as having a greater uh, degree of variability. Uh, I think the concentrations can change uh, in a shorter time span than what we're seeing in bedrock wells. And I think the magnitude of that change can be, uh, you know, substantial. Um, for example, I had a well in Bedford that uh, was non-detect for, for PFOA. And then um, sometime later, I forget the time span, it, it tested over 70 parts per trillion. So, you know, I think we see a much greater change in a short period of time in, in overburdened wells. And, you know, I, I can't say that I have a lot of uh, multiple data points from driven wells or, or uh, overburden wells to, to compare that are used for water supply. We have a lot from monitoring wells at, at St. Cobain. We do see a lot of variability there. Thanks. Yeah. Jeff, I have a question. Uh, sure. Um, just on the sampling variability, has any thought been given to error in the sampling methodology as far as you know inadvertent contamination while, while the sample is being obtained? I mean, we're hearing that PFA you know, is there any chance that some of this variability could be as a result of um, just something being introduced during the sampling or as at the collection was really wasn't residing in where the sample was meant to be taken? Yeah, that, that's another good question. I, I think there's always some risk of cross contamination, but you know, I, I think the industry, the sampling, the consultants, uh, DES, has recognized that. Uh, you know, because we're trying to measure something at, at the part per trillion level, which, you know, we haven't really measured widespread samples uh, at the part per trillion level, the risk of contamination is high. 
So uh, consultants and uh, DES staff have taken great pains to uh, minimize the chance of that happening. And you know, I, I could talk for quite a while about some of the what they're doing to, to do that, but uh, they're taking um, great pains to minimize cross-contamination of the samples. And I, I think some of the re repeatability, some of the bedrock wells are very consistent and, you know, almost to within the part per trillion, uh, you know, measured every three months. So I, I think that, uh, you know, between the sampling methodology and the lab methodology, I, I generally have pretty decent confidence in, in the results that are coming in. And, you know, I think it's uh, repeatable and I, I don't think we're seeing widespread scatter just due to, uh, you know, inadvertent um, additions to the sample that, uh, you know, are not coming out of the well. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, I guess seeing no other questions, I'll just wrap up quickly and then um, we can either have any, any other questions. But uh, so in, in terms of uh, looking at the superficial geology, um, if you look at, at this figure, I've, I've shown the light, what we call the LIDAR topographic image and LIDAR is very uh, detailed, high resolution uh, topography. It's a topographic image, uh, raised relief here is the way I'm showing it. And what you see is that uh, some of the wells with the, the low concentration of PFOA, so the green uh, samples, tend to be located in what I've color-coded tan, just to kind of draw your eye to it, areas where the topography has a smoother character, and in some cases it's got a fluted or sort of linear texture, which I think is representative of ice flow during the last glaciation. Um, and what I think we're looking at is a basal till or a till that was deposited at the base of glaciers. And I think in areas where uh, you tend to see a lot of the um, uh, exceedances, the topography is rougher. So I think there's uh, either less till or very shallow till, shallow bedrock uh, in those locations. So what I think this is uh, as a preliminary hypothesis is that some of the till cover, thicker till, basal till in Londonderry may impart some level of protection uh, to the underlying bedrock in terms of uh, preventing uh, the passage of PFAS from the surface into the underlying bedrock rockfers. And I, I think that's just one observation and, you know, we're continuing to evaluate uh, the data for other other ob observations that we can glean in terms of uh, hydrogeology and how this stuff is behaving in the subsurface. Uh, so with that, a uh, quick overview. I guess I'll take any other questions. Otherwise, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Aaron and the next speaker. Yeah, I just had a, a, a question regarding the... Uh the sampled uh, data have have you uh, turned this into like a a map where you can kind of see like say a well depth uh, at a particular geographic location versus the uh, you know the level of contamination if if any uh, just sort of see if it follows any aquifers or Yes, so so I do have GIS capability, and that that is something I look at. I look at uh, well construction, well depths. Uh, we had a, a series of data that were um, that were linked in uh, GIS to uh, the the well characteristics, and one thing that does jump out, uh, I think a, there's a strong relationship between the amount of casing uh, in the well. So, uh, and I think that correlates with the amount of overburden or superficial deposits, like I talked about here. So the greater amount of casing and the greater amount of overburden, I think there's a lower chance that the well is going to be contaminated or highly contaminated with, uh, with PFAS. Okay. Yeah. I, I know, uh, in my case specifically, uh, just, just on the east side of, uh, high range road. Uh, yeah, I've got a 450 foot, uh, deep well. Uh, I don't know what the depth of the other wells are, um, but uh, uh, I, just, I wasn't sure if that was like average deep. Yeah, I think I think a 450 foot well is not uncommon for for bedrock wells throughout New Hampshire and in Londonderry. All right. Well, thanks. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, George. Thanks, Jeff. So yeah, moving into um, what we're learning about the public water systems in the area like to bring in uh, Brandon Kernan is down there. Brandon, just take a moment to introduce yourself and your role at DES as well. And then I'll turn over the mouse to you during that. All right, thank you. I'm Brandon Kernan. I'm the administrator of the Drinking Water and Groundwater Bureau. Um, I've been working on PFAS really since we started dealing with it down at PEA since 2014 and worked with the Waste Division, even though we're in the Water Division, doing a lot of the initial characterization back in 2016 on um, the occurrence of PFAS around the St. Cobain uh, facility and the, the community surrounding it. 
Uh, but today I'm going to just give an overview of the status of public water systems in Londonderry. Um, first of all, I just want to go over what a public water system is. You know, Jeff mostly spoke about residential wells. Those are mostly on-lot wells that homeowners um, have on their property that they own, and they're not really subject to any ongoing state or federal regulations. They really just have initial regulations relative to construction location, construction details, and then if you have to do work on the well, um, some licensure requirements and, and construction requirements. Um, but there's another set of wells called public water systems. And I just wanna go through what a public water system is and the different types of public water systems and then describe what we see happening relative to PFAS and other contaminants in Londonderry to those systems. Um, first of all, a public water system is a system that serves at least 15 service connections or 25 people at least 60 days a year. So that's sort of the first question you ask. Um, are, are you, do you fit that category? If the answer is yes, um, then it means you're you're a public water system and you go to the next question are you serving 25 or more people who live on site so that's key live on site year round and if the answer to that that means you're sort of the most regulated class of public water systems a community water system so that could be like Merrimack Village District it could be a condominium complex in Londonderry you know they range quite a bit in size from you know, 25 people to you know Manchester Waterworks near 100,000 people. So those are community water systems serving the same people who reside in a in a certain place um, year round. If the answer to this question is no, you're still community water system because you serve more than 25 people 60 days a year, but you're a different type of um, community water system. You're called a non non community. Sorry. I'm gonna go back. Um, I'll bring you back and yeah, you just use the arrows. But I'll get you back yeah, there. It, okay. it was my button that got me in trouble. <laughs> so you're a non-community water system if you serve more than 25 um, people um, at least six months a year. And there's two types. There's something we called a transient water system. And that's a water system that serves a lot of people water every day, but they're generally the diff different people uh, on average. So it could be a campground where people just stay for a short period of time. It could be a restaurant. It could be a business that doesn't have a lot of employees, but it has a lot of customers and, and has water available. If you're though a, a, a non-community system that serves the same people water on a regular basis, but those people don't actually live where they're getting the water, so such as in a school or an office building, then you're a non-transient, non-community water system. So that's the second highest level of regulation because these people are exposed to the same water on a regular basis, whereas the transit system, the campground, the restaurant, you know, people are having short-term exposure and, and presumably irregular exposure. And so the sampling requirements um, are different for the different systems. Again, they're most extensive for the community systems. Then they're similarly extensive, but not quite as much so for the non-transient systems, the schools and offices where the same people are getting the same water every day. And then where people are, are irregularly drinking water, but a large number of people are accessing it, um, that's a transient system. And those systems really are regulated just to ensure there's no bacteria, nitrate, and nitrite at this time. And so these different categories all exist within London Dairy. So just an overview of the water systems in London Dairy. These dots on this map show standalone community water systems, um, non-community, non-transient systems, and transient systems. And so you can see they're scattered throughout the, the community um, based on where you see the dots. These lines are also um, community water systems. Coming in from the north, you see these um, lines are Manchester Waterworks water lines. The green lines are is the water system operated by Penichuk, which is getting water from Manchester. And then you'll see the some distribution lines associated with some of the other um, smaller community water systems in Londonderry. So altogether, there's 34 standalone systems in Londonderry, and then two major um, water systems that are bringing water in from outside sources of water. So community water systems and non-transient, non-community water systems, so those again are like the schools and offices, 
have to sample per PFAS per the state laws that Mike Wimsat talked about earlier. And so in London Dairy, we are exceeding, seeing exceedances of the MCL for 11 um, either community water systems or non-transient non-community water systems. And we've listed them in this table here with the population serve, the biggest one being uh, Century Village Condo, which is you know, right here, uh, right in the middle sort of of the slide and right adjacent to Penichuk Waterworks water system. If you add up the total population served um, that is exposed to water above the MCL, it's um, just under 1,800 people in this community. Um, one of these systems also has an exceedance for PFOS, but they also have a PFOA exceedance, so that doesn't really change the regulatory status. So these systems, per the state law, now have to sample on an ongoing basis to demonstrate compliance with the MCL. And the way that's achieved, and this is sort of the very simplistic summary of it, it's a little more nuanced than this, is that after four quarters of sampling, you take the average, and if you are over the MCL of, for this case, PFOA, 12 parts per trillion, it's a violation. And if you have a violation, it triggers a number of things. It requires that the water system notify the public using language provided by the state that's actually within the, the adopted rules. And then it requires that the water system start a process of developing a corrective action plan um, and submitting it to the department for review and approval and then implement it in accordance with the schedule. And so when there's a violation, it's not an immediate fine or something punitive of that nature. It's immediate steps are taken to notify the public that are exposed to the water about the levels and what it might mean to their health. And then the water system starts a process working with the state to correct the problem. The timeline for that process varies based on really site-specific um, considerations. Um, it could be financing issues. There might be you know, ongoing work to look at consolidating with another system. There may be loan and grant rounds that are part of the corrective action plan. And so you know, we really work with the water system to come up with a, a sensible approach to correct the problem, but trying to be as timely as we reasonably can to eliminate that exposure. All the while, the public is notified on a reoccurring basis about the, their water quality so that they can take appropriate measures um, to find alternative water until the situation is corrected. Mike already went over um, the new PFAS MCL, so I won't re reiterate that. But there's a lot of other things going on in New Hampshire relative to drinking water standards. Um, New Hampshire recently lowered its arsenic standard from 10 parts per billion, which is the federal MCL, to five parts per billion. And that could potentially impact six systems in, in London Dairy. Some of those systems in London Dairy are already treating for arsenic, but arsenic is costly and complicated to treat. And many of them may not be treating down to five parts per billion, or they may have to start maintaining their treatment systems in a different way that's much more costly, such that they'll want to look at alternatives rather than enhancing their current treatment. Others will now exceed the MCL. It didn't exceed it before because of, of that new standard. And this standard is incredibly important. Um, arsenic, although it's naturally occurring and it's occurs throughout New Hampshire in 20 to 30 percent of the wells above above this MCL, it is very to toxic. And even at this level, isn't nearly as protective as many other drinking water standards that are out there. It's at this level because you, you have to consider the practicality of treatment and the feasibility of it. And again, we're a leader in the nation along with New Jersey and taking steps to lower that arsenic standard because of our, our concerns. And you know, it's, it's a really important standard that we're implementing right now. It's effective July 1st of this year, but the rules are already in place. Another standard that has been adopted in the state by the waste division is for manganese, an ambient groundwater quality standard of 0 0.3 milligrams per liter. And that's by default an enforceable drinking water standard um, for public water systems. We also, in the drinking water program, are adop adopting a standard of 0 0.3 milligrams per liter, as well as a notification requirement of 0 0.1 milligrams per liter. You know, a lot of emerging research on manganese over the past five, 10 years has really sort of pivoted the concern about that contaminant of just being aesthetic to really having concerns about its impacts on, on infants and, and neurological development. And so, you know, in London Dairy, there's uh, just a small number of four systems that might be impacted. Again, some are treating for manganese already, but not consistently down to these levels and others may have to put in treatment um, to, to address um, these new standards. 
I just want to mention another group of contaminants that we haven't developed new standards for, but it's kind of unique to London Dairy and a couple other regions of the state. Um, in London Dairy, there's currently seven systems that are removing radionuclides, and this is in the water, not the air, and that is radium and uranium. And I mention this because those systems are also trickier to operate and more costly. And as you saw before from that slide with the population served, a number of these systems are very small. They don't have full-time staff. They have a small rate base. And so maintaining a radionuclide treatment system, an arsenic system, even a PFAS or magnesium system is more of a challenge for those systems. And with radionuclides, you also have another issue that is more complicated than other standards is that you in some cases generate a low level radioactive waste that you have to hire licensed rad waste brokers to, to take away and properly dispose of. It's just important that uh, you guys beat us to it really today, that as you look at PFAS, you look at all these contaminants holistically, as you look at town-wide options for addressing water quality concerns, because man-made or naturally occurring, um, they're all important to, uh, important to address. You know, one thing that's not mentioned here as well is radon and air, which we have no regulatory authority at the department for, but is one of the more serious environmental health risks in, in, in the state. And, and, you know, at this time, it was just education and outreach efforts for it, but it's it's something that could also be looked at with, if you work, if you thought, wanted to go in that direction as well. Hey, Brandon, a uh, quick question. Uh, we had a briefing last year, s similar to this, not quite as detailed as this, uh, by the fellow, I, I just, and his name slips my mind. He just recently retired as a senior guy. Uh, you probably know who I'm talking about. But anyway, uh, he was talking about one of the reasons that uh, the PFOAs became uh, such a concern, just one of the reasons was because they found that that was being passed from uh, breast milk to uh, to infants. Uh, it was, it was uh, found that, uh, as part of the research, but we've never heard the answer of, well, so what? 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 When? When that chemical is passed via breast milk to the infant, what is the risk or what is the the health concern for the infant at that point? So I, I could touch upon it, but I think John Alley, our toxicologist at the next meeting will be the best to really talk about it. You know, I, I do know one of the impacts is a development concern, low birth weights, which has other adverse health concerns. Um, but, you know, the impact to the baby when the mother's pregnant is was considered when we were making the standards. And again, I'm a hydrogeologist, so I'll defer to John Alley at the next meeting, but he'll, he'll totally be able to okay. engage with you. And you can speak with him ahead of time as well. If you'd like to on that. Great, thank you. So I just want to talk about um, standalone small community water systems because London Dairy has a number of them and a number of them that are going to be looking to make investments one way or another to address one of the water quality concerns I talked about. You know, and those investments could be treatment, it could be consolidating with another system. If they have one well it's not impacted and another well it is, it could be blending. But it's important to really think about standalone small community water systems sort of in the big picture. Uh, oftentimes people look at what's the quick cheapest fix, but when you have these small systems, they have other other challenges. And again, these systems I, I'm talking about Linda Dare are often less than 100 people serve, so very small customer base. You know, they often lack financial and te technical capacity to operate reliably and uh, to meet standards. And that can be because, you know, some homeowners are trying to run the water system to save money as opposed to hiring an operator. Or if they do hire an operator, they have to really meter what they allow that operator to do because of cost and the rate base. And so just for the long term, you know, even though a short term option may be easier to pay for, you really need to look at you know, 20, 30 years on where you want to be and what the reliability uh, of your system is going to be and, and the value of the investment today for the long term, just not for the next few years. You know, when these small systems do make improvements, it can be very costly um, to the ratepayers because they don't they don't have the base to divide it out upon, and sometimes they don't have the the borrowing capacity as well. Uh, I you know, it's not even just you know the improvement itself; it can be the maintenance. You know, we're aware of one system that has about 25 homes that needs to change out their arsenic resin, which is very costly, 
and they're spending about $25,000 every nine months, these 25 homes to, to replace the arsenic. And so, you know, clearly that from a long-term standpoint, that might make that option less desirable for some systems that may be able to connect to a, a nearby larger system. And there's just some other things that aren't even directly related to water quality and public health, but to public health in other ways, and also in property values and maybe reduced insurance pre premiums that if you do go away from a small system to a larger system and you have storage and proper flow and pipe sizes, you may get fire protection, whereas that almost is never provided by a small water system. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Brandon, are the the community systems that are have, that are having exceedances are they treating for it right now? No, they are not. I mean, they're just getting their rounds of data in, and you know, soon they'll be put on a schedule for gaining compliance, and that'll be by treatment or connecting to another system, and they'll be doing notification. The schedule for when all those things kick in kick in is kind of complicated, and I could give it to you separately for each system. You know, the rules were written so that when they took effect in 29, December 2019, we'd have four rounds of, or October, I'm sorry, 2019, we would have had four rounds of data by October 2020, and then systems would all be on schedule to notify and correct the problem. But with the litigation, systems had the choice of halting their sampling, and so some only collected one round, and they also had the choice of continuing it. So some got all their sampling done in one year and some are going on 18 months um, because the litigation messed up the sampling schedule. Um, so we're not on a uniform schedule anymore, but I'd have to go to each system in, in our database and give you a status of where they're at with um, having a violation register. Okay, thanks. Great. I just had a quick question. Um, I know initially that uh, I think the focus was uh, primarily like on well systems and PFAS, but uh, you mentioned some things with regard to public uh, well systems that, uh, uh, well, public water systems that basically has me thinking now. So there's a map that we're able to uh, view the, uh, you know, the PFAS levels at sampling the sites uh, throughout this area. I'm wondering if there's similar maps for other contaminants at uh, well sites. We do that not have a, a data viewer like we do for PFAS, but we, we certainly would be happy to support your task force on providing that data we, so we could generate maps that are contaminant specific um, that in, in the format that you, that you desire to support your efforts. We can readily do that, connect our database to GIS and make those maps. Yeah, it, it, it's just that if, uh, if there is concern for other contaminants, especially ones that you've identified as being, you know, say particularly high in, in a couple of places, uh, that just might shift things a bit as far as like what mitigation is in other words like PFAS is important but you might be stuck with arsenic uh, you know, high arsenic levels so so you might also want to consider you know this as well so uh, you're right. absolutely right because the process for treating for PFAS is completely different than arsenic and uranium and you know one of the systems on the list has a, a nitrate challenge and that's a different treatment process so you're absolutely right you need to have that all to, all that together to figure out what each system really needs to do um, to gain compliance. And, and so there, the, there was a possibility of getting access to some data or you could generate a map or um, I can't remember what you were starting to say on that topic. Yes, yes, we can produce um, hard copy or PDF maps. Um, we probably can't make a data viewer for each of the contaminants. Um, that took a lot of work to stand up for PFAS, but we can pretty easily make maps summarizing for all the analytes of concern, the status of each water system, as well as tables too. Okay, all right, uh, great, thanks. Great, thanks, Brandon. Well, after you've heard all of the um, issues with the community water systems and the other water systems in the in the town of London Dairy, I think Amy and I will be the ones that get to talk about funding and, and really the options for these community water systems. And while you know, we talk about it, and I'll let Amy introduce herself um, afterwards, but as we talk about it, you know, keep in mind, as Brandon was showing on those maps, some of these water systems are close to public waters, some of them aren't, but when you're thinking about long-term planning, 
you know, some of the programs that Amy and I are talking about are really to kind of get them the leg up to start developing what their long-term plan is. Um, so it's really important to keep that in mind as we have this discussion. So Amy, I'll, I'll turn it over to you first. And if you can introduce yourself and the role you have at DES, and I will give you the control. Okay. So I'm Amy Rousseau. I'm the PFAS response administrator for the department. Um, what I do is I administer funds that the DES received from the Drinking Water and Groundwater Trust Fund to study, investigate, and sample for PFOS. So it's part of that fund that allows for the sampling that the MTBE Bureau has been doing in Londonderry outside the consent decree. Um, and I also um, will be administering the PFOS remediation loan fund. And here we go. So I wanted to start, there's two different um, PFOS specific funding sources. Um, I wanted to start with the PFOS Remediation Loan Fund. So this was established under RSA 45-H and that was part of House Bill 1264 that was passed back in July that also established the PFOS MCLs. So what this fund is, is it's a $50 million fund from the state for the remediation of PFOS contamination. It's a low interest loan program for community and a small sector of the non-transient public water systems. And that would be nonprofit, non-transient. So communities and nonprofit, non-transient public water systems. And these are systems that have uh, an MCL exceedance. So um, any one of the four MCLs would be considered an exceedance. This program offers some loan forgiveness, 10% loan forgiveness for disadvantaged community systems. Um, and then there is another piece of this, which is contingent reimbursement. Um, so this is 50%, they have a, an opportunity to receive up to 50% reimbursement of a loan. And that is gonna be based on any um, funds that the state receives from settlements or litigation of um, from the lawsuits that we have with the manufacturers of PFOS. And so, so these communities and nonprofit, non-transient water systems have an opportunity to get a low interest loan, but also to get some of this money back um, in the future. And then I want to discuss the second uh, PFOS specific pot of money that we have there's an $800,000 appropriation, and this is part of the funds that I administer that we received from the Drinking Water Groundwater Trust Fund. And so with this money, um, any school, this is any school and any child care center, um, they do not have to be a public water system, or any transient or non-transient public water system is eligible for reimbursement of up to 26% of design services for treatment installation. So this gives an opportunity um, for those systems outside of the community water systems, you know, to take or to have some um, relief with funds for PFOS. Um, so that's basically, that, that is a pretty simple one. Like I said, it's all schools and all child care centers, whether they are private water or public water, and then the transients and non-transient public water systems. So then what I did is I put together a little table for you. So what I have here is I took all the community and non-transient water systems in Londonderry that have had some sampling done for PFOS so far. And so I wanted to kind of show you specifically what they would be able to tap into. Um, so you'll see the design services reimbursement. That one is pretty simple and straightforward. So, um, so that one's either a yes or a no. And it doesn't matter whether you're inside the consent decree or outside the consent decree. Um, and then we move over to the PFOS remediation loan fund. So this fund comes with some eligibility requirements. And so at this time, and I put a little note there, this is as of today, this is whether um, this fund would be available to them. So things could change in the future that could change their eligibility, um, which could make them go from a no to a yes, except those three at the top, which are, they're not nonprofits. So they would not be eligible 
for the loan fund at any point. But all the ones below that, if if something changed, then there there's a possibility. Um, and so I encourage that any of these systems, if they are curious about the funding, to call me and have a conversation because it's it's not always black and white. Sometimes it it takes a conversation to figure out um, whether they are eligible for the PFOS remediation loan fund. Um, and I also wanted to make a note, there are no transients on here, and that's because as Brandon mentioned, the transients are not required to sample for PFOS. Um, they are all eligible for the design services reimbursement. And as part of um, the Drinking Water Trust or other fund that we got, part of that money, the MTBE Bureau is going to be sampling all transient water systems. Um, I don't have a time frame for that right now, but um, I'm sure we can we can talk to them and, and get you a better timeline for that. But but so you know that in the future there will be PFOS sampling for the transient water systems. And I think that's basically it for the PFOS specific funding. Does anyone have any questions before I turn it back over to Aaron? Um, well, uh, so uh, Tom Garside did send a message in the chat, Amy, and it was asking about funds for residential wells. And I said, no, there are none at this time. And then I was going to say, except a, a child care on a private residential well, is that considered in the, um, the design services or are those? Yes. So if, okay. if someone runs a child care out of their home, that would be considered eligible for the design services reimbursement. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so thanks, Amy. Um, you know, those are the PFAS specific funding programs as Amy's described. And really then the, the drinking water, groundwater trust fund, and then I'll touch very briefly on another funding program that um, you know is a, a little more broad of an application. Um, but obviously contamination is included as eligible projects. And the Drinking Water and Groundwater Trust Fund um, was established a couple of years ago with monies that came from a trial between the state and Exxon Mobil for the contamination of drinking water from gasoline, um, the additive MTBE. Sometimes uh, folks get confused between the MTBE settlement fund that was the, um, the funds that came from the parties that settled outside of court that money is very specific and can only be used for MTBE related projects. Um, the Drinking Water and Groundwater Trust Fund was established in a statute that took that award from the trial and the use of that funds is really dictated by the statute. And the fund is overseen by a 19 member Drinking Water and Groundwater Advisory Commission. Um, Senator Morris is the chair of that commission. I believe he's on this meeting as well, listening in. Um, and they admit they award grants and loans. Um, the loans are revolving loan fund for the drinking water infrastructure projects, amongst other um, projects that are either DES led, there's also source water protection. But really today I'm talking to you about drinking water infrastructure. Um, New Hampshire DES, we're responsible for the administration of that fund. And myself, I'm, I'm the one who administers the fund here at the at DES. Um, the commission, over the last couple of years have funded many projects. I think we're at about 70 drinking water infra infrastructure projects. Through all of the work that they've done and the projects that they've funded, they have always maintained and identified that the biggest priority to them is addressing contamination. Um, and you'll see in one of my later slides where they actually put that into practice and allow projects to come in at any time related to contamination. And so I think that's just, you know, for what we're talking about today, and we're ta not talking about these small systems that need water main improvements, you know, they have a contamination issue that needs to be addressed and that continues to be their highest priority. Um, the fund balance as of the end of last year is about $153 million. And what the commission does is they outline an allocation of that funds based on 20% of the corpus for the annual budget. So obviously there's, um, you know, as time goes on and funds are awarded, that that allocation will go down. So right now we're proposing about a 30 million allocation for their grant and loan program. Um, and so that, you know, that's just how the fund is managed on an annual basis. 
And so with the with the fund um, and with the work of DES and, and the commission, we've established a couple of funding pathways that I think are very relevant to what we're talking about today. And really, London Dairy and some of other communities that are impacted with contamination were the driver for DES's development of a public water system consolidation study program. And this was awarded about was awarded two hundred thousand dollars in February by the Drinking Water and Groundwater Commission. And what it does is it offers ten thousand dollar grants to communities, small community water systems that exceed an MCL. So PFOS is applicable, as well as the other contaminants um, that that Brandon was mentioning, the arsenic and I think Brandon did a great job of explaining the challenges that these small systems face, you know, the challenges with their governance, usually a volunteer board. Um, they don't have a lot of extra cash on hand. They might not be looking to the future for management or, or asset management of their system. And so they face a lot of problems. And one of those problems we've identified is when they have to make the decision of do we treat or do we just interconnect to a larger, more viable system? And that can be prohibitive if you don't have any cash in hand to do that analysis. Usually you would want an engineer to come in to do the evaluation to really outline the capital cost and long-term treatment versus the capital cost and then the long-term, you know, the rate paying and, and what they would have to do to join that public water system. And we looked at this program and got support by the commission for it as an opportunity to help these systems make decisions. So you know, that's kind of what I was talking about. Today, this is available for them. Um, we'll have applications due, uh, available by the middle of this month that we can hand out. If a system, um, I think Brandon mentioned Century Village, you know, we can hand them this application and say, we know you have an MCL exceedance. Let's get you started to figure out what the best solution is. And they can they can get this grant tomorrow and start working towards figuring out their option. Um, so this is really out there and that can help these systems today. But then as you in the town start to think about that long-term plan and where you wanna go and do you want to start looking at um, extending water within the town, these systems will be primed and ready to make their decision of do we connect or do we not connect? And we're seeing this um, being put out in, into play in Plastow, where the water line that we've been working on for the Southern New Hampshire area is going out and the town is trying to get customers to their system. And they have a lot of small systems with water quality issues. And this grant program will also help them so that the systems can, be, can make the best decision. And it also helps the town so that they can make those decisions and the town can figure out how to extend their system. So, we see the benefits um, immediately in the Southern New Hampshire area, but obviously this is a statewide program, but this is out there, um, DES is, is talking about it. And once we have the application available, we'll, we will be providing that to potential um, recipients of the grant fund. So that's one of the first programs we stood up. And like I said, we stood this up in February of this year to really address the issues that you're seeing in London Dairy. Um, and then the, the larger infrastructure programs, the real, the real meat of what the Drinking Water and Groundwater Advisory Commission does is um, the Special Projects Assistance Program and their annual Drinking Water Infrastructure Assistance Program. And, you know, these are the primary funding pathway for drinking water infrastructure projects for public water systems. So again, we're not talking about residential wells here. Um, but uh, the loan and grants, um, there is a process we have in place and they're awarded by the commission. And the special projects program is really for a project that meets one of their four criteria or considerations. Contamination, as I mentioned before, is one of those considerations. Those projects could come in at any time. So using the model of the system that Brandon pointed out, um, Century Village that's near Penachuk, that system's pathway could be going to, um, to get the consolidation grant to figure out what their process is. If it says that you know interconnecting with Penachuk is the most feasible option, they can go to Amy's program and they can get a loan for that program. They could come into the trust fund and request a portion of that as a grant. So you know these 
programs all work together um, to help find a solution and fund a solution for these systems. And then our other real bread and butter of the trust fund is the annual drinking water round, and that's held once a year in September. Again, any project can come in under that, including contamination, but I really think the special projects pathway is the most important for these systems that are facing contamination issues. Um, and then eligible applicants, and I think this is important for you in the town as well. Unlike um, a lot of the other programs and the funding mechanisms that are out there, our eligible applicants aren't only public water systems, but a municipality or any political subdivision of the state. So what that means is the town of Londonderry could apply for financing or for um, assistance. And I have been speaking with Kevin about the uh, area near the Apple Tree Mall. You know, because the town is eligible and is an eligible applicant, there is a financing pathway for them through the Drinking Water and Groundwater Trust Fund and through that special projects assistance program that we talked about as well. So um, I think that's really what sets the trust fund apart right now. Um, you know, in the light, there might be some changes to the PFAS loan fund, but right now today, the, the trust fund is the best pathway for a municipality to come in. Um, and then as well as um, eligible applicants are those non-transient, non-community water systems owned by a nonprofit organization. So, that's, uh, let me see what else I got here. So that's my overview for the trust fund. Um, I'd like to wrap up with really that discussion and we've been asking questions along, but we really would like to hear from the task force, you know, your role, what you see your role is and what you see DES's role is in executing your mission and where we can fit into that um, with you. But before we jump into that, um, do you have any questions for Amy or I right now about the funding? Tom? Yeah, uh, Aaron, thank you. Um, one of the, 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 I think I understood what you what you just talked about uh, with funding and so forth, but on the other end of the spectrum, really at the micro level, uh, some of the costs uh, the community members are looking at are getting their, their well tested at the, at the individual home, but get, mm -hmm. getting their well tested. And, I, and we know that sometimes St. Cobain is, paying for that and sometimes DES is paying for that but we I think we need to identify this the spectrum of of who who can pay or who should pay and and if the homeowner is going to pay who should they go to who's a who do you guys recommend as here's here's some testing firms uh, that you could go to and here's what typically what they would would charge you and then mm -hmm. on the other end of that depending on what how that test comes back um, what are the what are the pinpoint solutions at the individual home level? A point of view system for the for the kitchen sink, or a point of view system for the whole home a whole home solution. And uh, I, I know this is kind of veers off of what what your briefing was, but that's where many hundreds of our residents are at, uh, and they're they're anxious. Uh, you know, as if they, if they, when they find out they've got uh, water that's above the uh, the safe limit, and they want to move out to get it, you mm -hmm. know, to fix that, uh, where do they go to get the test? Is is there any financial help with that? And then where do they go to get uh, some type of filter solution? Uh, and is there any money to help with that? Okay. Yeah. So um, as far as the treatment side of things, there's nothing in place right now. Um, one of the things we did talk with the town about yesterday was just what some of those options are and really the scale of the difference of cost either to the homeowner or if the town was going to develop some sort of cost share program. I think it's important for them to understand the types of options that are available in the range and then the potential cost associated with it. And to move into that realm of treatment, um, you know, I think there, there can be creative solutions and cost share solutions, but right now today, there is nothing available to a private homeowner to go down that path um, with any financial assistance. As right, far this, as, oh, I'm, go I'm, ahead. Sorry, part, of the, part of the issue is, that is, uh, if we think of this as, as a system solution, but at the at the at the many uh, individual homes, 
is that you know American enterprise is a wonderful thing. There, there is right now a vacuum of that will be filled quite quickly, I'm sure, with with creative business people that will start doing testing and start offering filtering solutions and so forth. And uh, we're we're not smart enough at this point, uh, I, and I mean we at the town level aren't smart enough at this point to figure out what's a reasonable cost mm -hmm. for, the, for the homeowner for both testing and, and filtering solutions and who are reliable suppliers of these products. Uh, and, and, you know, how do, if a homeowner comes to us and said, you know, if I'm about to pay $1,000 for a water test and $15,000 for a filter system, it, it, am I being taken advantage of because I'm, I'm nervous and worried? Uh, or is that about right? Uh, mm -hmm. so, so I think that those, some of those services would be very helpful to help, help us make sure that we could guide our residents to good mm -hmm. uh, solutions that are, that are cost uh, reliable in terms of uh, value, uh, the good, uh, of good value. I mean, I, I'm not trying to predict what the cost should be, but I think the yeah. thing is we want to have good value so that they don't get a six hundred dollar solution and pay pay ten thousand dollars for it. Right. I think Brandon, you know, he just popped on. I, you know, Brandon, if you want to just give, you know, a very high level um, view of what that scale of cost means and and why you on the and the town side, we know you've heard some people calling and saying it's going to cost me twenty thousand dollars. I think Brandon could put that into context for you. Great. Thanks. Sure, and we do have some documents to assist homeowners to uh, address the question you have. Again, if they want to address it on their own before you know other actions are taken, on where they can test their water, and so we we discuss the considerations and what type of test methods you might use, and then we list out the labs that are accredited and that we know have worked with residents in New Hampshire. And people shouldn't hesitate to call a number of the labs to get quotes, even out of state, because they have incredible shipping um, contracts that makes shipping these samples quite doable, quite different than the rates that we would get shipping our own items. And so they can sample using that guidance. The cost, um, it would be from 170 for a very limited number of analytes to possibly $350. Um, you know, I do know some labs will quote you five, 600, and say their staff needs to come out and do it uh, in person. That's, in my opinion, not necessary. Even even a homeowner with instructions that hasn't sampled water before, if they follow the instructions, can collect a, a reliable sample. And so we can share that with you. And if you see gaps in what you think your residents are looking for, it's a document where we do update as people point out areas that it's sufficient in. As far as treatment goes, we also have a document talking about treatment options for the homeowner. Uh, that, that they can consider. And there's a couple options. You have point of use, that'd be in your kitchen. So maybe just the kitchen sink and maybe you would hook it up to the ice maker and refrigerator as well. And you could use carbon, which would only really remove the PFAS and it wouldn't address the arsenic or uranium or anything like that. Or you could do reverse osmosis. Again, a dedicated tap at the uh, kitchen sink and maybe connect to your refrigerator. And that would take out a lot more contaminants. Um, you know, it would take out a good percentage of arsenic, not necessarily all of it, all of the uranium and things like nitrate as well. The cost for those point of use systems, if you do it yourself, and maybe the town requires a permit. So when you say do it yourself, you need to see if the town requires that or not, so you don't mislead anyone. Um, it would be two to three hundred dollars to buy one of those units online or from a big box store. Um, if you were to hire someone, it could. Again, you'd want to get quotes from multiple firms and hear about their technology, but it could be you know, $800 to $1,500 for the point of use. Again, just treating a couple fixtures. For a whole house, it's a much more complex question. You, you know, We could share some work plans where we've seen whole house filters go in for just PFAS, and I think the cost can be four to $6,000. But the big asterisk there is, is that's just to remove PFAS, and you don't want to mislead people to put in carbon units and say, now the water is great because they put in a carbon unit. Again, that doesn't touch on many of those naturally occurring contaminants. So the whole house filter can be much more costly if you're trying to address your water quality holistically. You might have to remove manganese, you might have to remove arsenic, and then you could start getting very high in costs um, um, for the whole house filters. But again, our fact sheet 
sort of vacuum those things. And if you want to review them and point out areas uh, that you don't think meet your needs, we can update them. Brandon, what, one uh, follow-on question, and then I'll let my fellow uh, committee members start to ask questions because I'm trying, I'm trying not to dominate the the uh, discussion here. But one question that we were asked, and I, I can't answer it, and that is, if you have a, a reverse osmosis uh, solution, then the, uh, typically that we, we understand that the filters are, are rinsed or washed by the system, and then that, that uh, wastewater is put into the septic tank. Uh, and you can correct me if I, if I get this wrong, but the, the question is, are we putting those chemicals back into the ground, back into the groundwater at, you know, at a, even now at a higher concentration uh, and, uh, uh, or, or is that something we shouldn't worry about? So uh, it might be a gasp after I say this, but it's something in this situation you shouldn't worry about. I mean, you're essentially reuniting the contaminants with the water that they were in before it was going to the septic system in the first place. Had you not treated it, you would use the water and it would go to your septic system. So you're not increasing the mass of PFAS. You know, treatment or no treatment, it was all going to the septic system. So you're not changing the mass balance in a meaningful way. The other thing is, is you're talking about what you, especially if it's point of use, your potable water, you know, a few gallons a day, you know, there's hundreds of thousands, millions of gallons circulating through the system, the area, has a broad contamination from aerial deposition, you know, this is not gonna affect the concentration distribution whatsoever. And most importantly, you're eliminating exposure to contaminants in drinking water. You're achieving the most important objective. And I, if, I, uh, if I could just jump in on the, the topic of um, public well, or uh, where we can get some sampling uh, done. Uh, so there's there's really two areas, uh, inside the consent decree and outside the consent decree. So outside the outer boundary. I would urge uh, residents who are interested in having their well sampled, who haven't had it sampled, to go to the uh, DES PFAS investigation webpage, and we can provide links. I'm sure the town may already have them up, uh, to where they can fill out uh, a survey form that I talked about uh, during the talk, and uh, that goes to our uh, MTBE sampling group, and you know they can evaluate sampling the wells. I also have an 800 number here. If I can uh, get my right screen to pop up, uh, bear with me just one second. Um, so for people that are located inside the consent decree where St. Cobain is uh, doing the sampling, as I showed on my slides, uh, there's an 800 number. Uh, it's 1-800-742-8498. And uh, that goes to a St. Cobain uh, messaging system. and uh, Residents can expect a call back in about three to five days. Um, there, there's a, a bit of a time lag before they get back to folks, but um, you know that'll be then distributed to uh, their consultants for uh, consideration of uh, the next round of sampling. Question? Um, following up on Tom's question about reverse osmosis, um, I understand, what is it, for every gallon usable water you get, you have at three, you basically have to lose. I'm just concerned about, um, are you basically quadrupling or tripling the amount of the volume of water you're discharging into your septic system now? No, because point of use would be just at the kitchen faucet, a dedicated tap at the faucet, not even your main faucet and maybe an ice maker. And so while the average person uses 70 or so gallons a day, and then maybe twice as much if they're watering outside. You're all, that drinking water potable tap, you would only be using a couple gallons a day. And so you're talking about using five gallons more water a day or so if you have reverse osmosis, and that won't change the equation for most wells, almost okay. all wells. So that would be for a point of use. Would you want to use reverse osmosis for point of entry? No, absolutely not. And, Okay. I've got a question, I guess, regarding, uh, so the other options where you've got a granulated uh, activated charcoal or uh, a resin-based system that uh, you know, collects the, uh, the PFASs and then uh, you replace your filters. Uh, what happens from a disposal perspective? Like, what happens? What happens yeah. right now? Now, if you're working with a contractor, 
they take it back. And I understand that many of them have arrangements to return it to the providers of the carbon material and regenerate it out of state. If a resident's taking care of it on their own, they would dispose of it as solid waste uh, at this time. And in New Hampshire, our solid waste you know, goes to secured um, landfills or high temperature incineration. We don't necessarily believe it's the optimal solution for disposal, but it's the best one right now. There's a whole lot of PFAS challenges out there and a whole lot of solutions that are needed and getting it out of the drinking water is priority number one. And we are aware of all these other things that need to be figured out. That list is long and it'll be three or four more meetings. We want to go to the to-do list on PFAS. So that's the options right now. Okay. Uh, I, I had another uh, a quick one regarding um, way back when uh, going through how the um, the MCLs are established, and you said that uh, you, you basically had like a lot of people doing work, consultants, and a bunch of reports being generated. Uh, do we have access to those reports? Yes, they're available online, and we can follow up with links to the decision okay. document that includes both the technical. Well, there's two rounds: our initial proposal and then our revised proposal, as well as our response to comments, really from all sides of the spectrum, people that wanted a really, really low number and people that wanted no number and, and our assessment of their science and why we made the decisions we did. And there's a statutory obligation that we continuously review this standard as well as other standards uh, to make sure we feel that there's no new science that warrants lowering them or raising them. A follow-up to uh, piggyback on George's question for Aaron, can, can uh, you share with us an electronic copy of the presentations tonight? Yes, what I was going to do as well, um, I'll send this over tomorrow, it was get, gather some of these links that the team is talking about, and I'm going to put it at the very end. I have a contact slide for us, and then I, I'll put in all these key links, the survey monkey, the phone number, and the, the documents that everybody's talking about. So you have that, and it could be um, you know, used by anybody that if you post it on your website. Great, thanks. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, no, no. Uh, yeah, that was uh, th that was really uh, it. So, uh, uh, yeah, if there's like on, if those reports are available online, uh, I don't know if there could be like a follow up with with some links. Uh, that'd be that'd be great. Appreciate that. Thank you, Brandon. Okay. Well, we're coming up to about nine o'clock now. Um, does anybody have any other questions? And like we said, a lot of this, um, we're going to be diving very deep into the data and the, the health effects and the standard um, coming up in, in May at the meeting. Um, are there any other questions today or anybody that isn't shown on the, on the screen um, in the audience who might have any questions from uh, the chat or anything or any last words? Erin, I, I wanted to... Uh say thank you to you and your team for especially for sticking around so late at night uh, I know that uh, uh, th this is time away from your families and and we really we really do appreciate it we know how much of a stretch it is so thank you so much yes thank, thank you. you very much you're welcome we're happy to do it <laughs> this is a lot of information and you know we recognize the position that London Dairy's in and you know, I think, um, you know, the establishment of the task force is a great start for them. And, you know, I think it is, it, it's going to take a lot of people to kind of work together to start moving forward and finding a solution. So this is a great start. Oh, and uh, um, it's actually been more informative than, uh, than I thought. And you've given me some additional points to consider as well. So thank you. Excellent. Okay. Um, Director Wimsat, do you have any final remarks? Sure. Thanks, Aaron. So I just wanted to thank uh, the task force members for inviting us to present tonight. Um, we were really happy to do it. I hope that it was helpful and we we'll look forward to working with you closely in the coming uh, weeks and months to attack this problem. So thank you again for your attention this evening. Thank you, Mike. Um, do you have to do a roll call to adjourn? I think you lost Bob Kelly. Oh. Or Bob no, Kelly. I don't we, need don't, we don't need to do a roll call. Uh, we we probably uh, this was my I had trouble logging in and I I was really supposed to do that 91A uh, introductory introductory speech for online meetings. I didn't get to it, so <laughs> we'll just chalk it up and maybe we'll do it twice next time. <laughs> well, Bob took care of it for you, so you okay. got it. You you can check the box. <laughs> Thanks, Bob.
All right. So with that, I'm going to end the um, end the virtual meeting, um, which will also stop the recording, and uh, in, we'll follow up with the documents from tonight, uh, tomorrow, uh, this for you all to have. So thank you. And, and for, our, for our team, for our team here in London, there we'll end the meeting uh, simultaneously, and I'll get back to you. We're thinking about meeting again in two weeks, but we'll get, we'll make sure we send you a meeting notice, and we'll be back in the conference room. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you.